strength training for cognitive function, blood lipids, fat loss, heart health. And the data now is very clear. Strength training is the most effective form of exercise for pure fat loss. This is a hard hitting statement in your book. This is a okay. direct quote. You said, focusing on cardiovascular activity for fat loss is a fantastic way to fail at fat loss. Yeah, 100%. Um, so I do want to uh, start off by being uh, very clear because I don't want to send the wrong message. So cardiovascular activity or exercise is good for you. All activity done properly and applied appropriately is going to improve your health. The challenge or the problem is when people make cardiovascular activity the cornerstone of a fat loss routine. So they don't go into it saying, I just want to improve my health and gain more stamina. They say, I want to lose 30 pounds. Let me pick this form of exercise and make this the cornerstone of my routine. And it's just, uh, it's, it's a terribly uh, ineffective um, form of exercise for that, for a few different reasons. Mm -hmm. I think first though, we need to start with why that's typically chosen as the frontline form of exercise. Because if you talk to the average person and you say, hey, what's the best form of exercise for fat loss? They're probably gonna pick a form of cardio, right? They'll say running or cycling or swimming or something along those lines. And it really goes back to this, um, which there's there's truth to this, but it's just oversimplification, to this model of, of weight loss that we've understood for decades now, right? Uh, and the model is that you need to burn more calories than you take in, or put differently, take in less calories than you burn. And you create that energy imbalance, and then that's how you lose weight, which is true. It's much more complex than that, but there's truth to that. So then what they've done, and we won't talk about the food part yet. We can talk about that later. Let's look at the calorie burn part, right? When they say, okay, we need to burn more calories, what they did is they looked at all forms of activity and they've ranked them um, in terms of how many calories you burn while you do them. So this is how people will typically rank the value of different forms of exercise. They'll say, how many calories does that burn in an hour? That's more effective than that one over there because it burns more calories. And that's wrong because it ignores the real most important uh, factor to consider with exercise, which is, how does this form of exercise get my body to adapt? And then what does that mean? Because that's that's what we really want to focus on. So why should we not look at calories burned while we exercise? Well, number one, it's not a lot. So even if you did an hour of cardio every single day vigorously, average person is going to burn maybe 250 to 300 calories doing that. By the way, those cardio machines at the gym will lie to you. So you'll do a elliptical and it'll tell you burn 800 calories. They they make those numbers up, I yes. think, to get people to buy um, those machines. Average person, 250 to 300 calories. Um, and it's a very um, manual way of doing so. It takes a lot of work. I'm dedicating an hour of strenuous activity to burn this 250 to 300 calories. But that's not it. That's not all. That form of exercise induces adaptations in the body that eventually get my body to learn how to burn less calories. So initially, I'm burning more calories by doing that. But because the that form of exercise requires little strength. It really doesn't require much strength to do long distance jogging or cycling or swimming or an elliptical. Um, it does require a lot of stamina and because it is calorie, I guess, intensive for the time being done, your body adapts to try to become better at it or more efficient at it. So to use an analogy, it would be like owning um, a, a very advanced AI car that adapted to your driving habits so imagine if you own this car and you drove 350 miles every day at 40 miles an hour, right? How would this car adapt? Well, it would become a one cylinder engine, would burn very, very little gasoline or become battery operated, become very efficient with energy, right? And so this is what your body ends up doing. You end up paring muscle down in order to become more efficient and have a better capacity for the stamina, require less energy to do these types of activities. So over time, what you see is you'll initially see a weight loss, then the body adapts to become better, and then you get this real strong plateau. And by the way, that initial weight loss, and studies will show this, a nice chunk of that comes from muscle. Now you're not burning the muscle, your body's just adapting and paring the muscle down. So you end up with a slower metabolism, which is why when people do that, they initially lose weight, they plateau, and then to continue losing weight, they have to do more cardio or cut their calories even more. And that that road leads to uh, something that's just not sustainable. You know, I'm, I'm eating 
1,600 calories, 1,500 calories or less a day. I'm doing an hour of cardio five or six days a week. I've only lost 15 of the 30 pounds I want to lose. This is not sustainable for most people. So instead, what we need to do is we need to look at exercise and say, which form of exercise induces the adaptations that will make my body want to burn more calories on its own? It doesn't require me to go and try and move. Which one's going to end up with or help me end up with a sustainable body where I can maintain this with less work and stay leaner easier? And the answer to that is it's strength training, resistance training. It's by far the most effective form of exercise for fat loss, but much more. And I cover a lot more of that in the book. And what you're saying is incredibly logical. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at adaptation, what type of adaptation for our for our bodies, for right. our metabolism, for our hormones are we really looking to to create? But this isn't regularly talked about. No. It's more, and I love this. You just literally brought it up, which is we're looking specifically at calories burned doing the thing, yeah. Versus when we're doing resistance training and not having that hyper focused kind of tunnel vision on that one thing, looking at the metabolic changes, which we're going to talk about. But I want to lean into this a little bit more because essentially, when you talked about that adaptation. When doing a lot of cardio, you're creating a body that gets very good at doing a lot of cardio. Yeah. So let's extrapolate that a little bit more. Yeah, you know, there was a study that was done that I remember when I first saw, really confirmed what those of us in the gym and fitness industry have known for a long time. I, I've been in gyms professionally for over two decades. And we would refer to um, members who would come in and j jump on the Stairmaster and the treadmill day in and day out as cardio bunnies. Um, and very typical, they would uh, kind of skinny, you know, uh, excuse the term skinny fat, right? They would lose a lot of muscle, body fat percentage would be kind of high, and they'd be kind of stuck in this kind of plateau. And sometimes they'd come and talk to me as a gym manager, why isn't this working? What's going on? I'm coming in every single day. And we saw that all the time. Um, well, there was a study that was done on a modern hunter gatherer um, tribe called the Hadza. Okay, so they, they live the way that humans probably lived, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Okay, so no modern technology, um, no modern agriculture. Uh, they hunt their food, they gather. Uh, very active in comparison to the average Western couch potato, okay? And scientists went down there and with some really sophisticated uh, testing, were able to test their metabolisms. How many calories are these Hadza tribes people burning every single day? Now the results were remarkable. What they found was that these Hadza tribes people burned generally the same amount of card, uh, calories as the average Western couch potato. So at, at first, you think to yourself, how is this possible? They're moving all the time. I mean, the way you hunt as a hunter-gatherer is you stalk your prey, you throw something at it, you injure it, and then you run after it for you yeah. know, 10 miles till, till it gets exhausted, and then you bring it back. It's like, how are they burning as many calories as you know John, who sits on his couch and watches TV and has a desk job? But if you really think about it, it makes perfect sense. If our bodies uh, didn't adapt to become more efficient with that type of activity, there's no way humans would have survived. It's very hard to come across calories in nature. You know, if we were burning 8,000 calories a day because we were running after prey and gathering food, we, we just, we wouldn't have made it. Yeah. So that type of activity teaches our bodies to become very, very efficient. Uh, there's also studies done on uh, contestants from The Biggest Loser. I don't know if you're familiar with that show. So this show, um, by the way, any trainer who's been a trainer for a long period of time, that show is like the bane of, of fitness. You watch it and you're like, man, they do everything wrong. But they beat these people up. They have them run like crazy. They use weights like cardio. So they make them do circuits and they restrict their calories. They lose tons and tons of weight. And then afterwards, there was a study that followed them. And it found that, uh, well, weight gain was quite common. And those that were able to maintain the weight loss were eating something like 1,300 calories a day and active all the time. That's unsustainable for most people, especially when you consider modern life where food is everywhere. It's easily accessible. It's, you know, very challenging. You know, getting an hour of exercise every day, you know, for people like me, I'm a fitness fanatic. It's hard to keep me out of the gym. But the average person, if we can convince the average person to work out twice a week consistently, we've done a phenomenal job. And we're probably not going to get much more than that. So it's just an unsustainable approach. And so those adaptations lend themselves well to the activity that you're trying to do. You become more efficient with calories. You burn less while you're doing it. Your body pairs muscle down. It organizes its hormones in a way to do so. And you become a, a more efficient calorie storing machine. 
in contrast to strength training in which you don't burn a ton of calories while you strength train, but the adaptations, the muscle building process, even just the signaling of building muscle, you don't even have to build a ton of muscle, just telling your body, we need more muscle and feeding your body appropriately, your, your body becomes less efficient with calories. You see yourself, your metabolism start to actually speed up. And the result of that, which I experienced time and time again as a trainer is, I'd get clients to lose weight over time at the end of their, you know, quote unquote, weight loss journey, or when we hit their goal, they're eating more than they did when they started. Now that's, that's sustainable, you know? Um, imagine if I could snap my fingers and make everybody be able to burn, you know, 800 more calories a day. I would solve a lot of the obesity epidemic just from doing that. So, um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's the big focus of, of that particular form of exercise and why it's, why it's failed, why, why it just doesn't work for so many people. Wow, that's powerful. And th the thing is too, number one, what, what I really admire about you is we have this clinical data, yes, mm. check, but you also have this real world experience in working with all these people and being able to see this firsthand. And we cannot negate this. Mm -mm. Like it's one of the most important things in the human experience, you know, this quote, anecdotal data. Like you see this firsthand and say something that's so mm -hmm. kind of counterintuitive in how we're trained somebody's eating more calories at the end, they've reached their weight loss goals and they're actually being able to eat more. Like that doesn't make sense. Right. Because again, if you see the suffering that people have yes. had to undertake doing The Biggest Loser, where they have to maintain this incredibly low amount of, like that, that should be relegated to like an eight year old, yeah, right, for the rest of their life and keep exercising their face off in order to maintain that weight loss. Yeah, you know, you talked about, uh, you mentioned clinical data. You know, the studies now, finally, are supporting what I'm saying. There's yeah. a lot of studies now. A lot now. But if you go back, when I started in fitness uh, over two decades ago, there were none on strength training. All the studies that were done on exercise to look at the benefits of exercise on health and fat loss and cognitive function were all cardiovascular based. Part of that is because um, it's probably, it's, it's a lot easier to get a hamster to run on a hamster wheel than it is to get a hamster to lift weights. So animal <laughs> studies are easy right. with cardio. Yeah. It's also, you need to know a little bit about strength training to study strength training with subjects versus, hey, let's just have people run uh, or cycle and then we'll look at the effects. So all the studies done, you know, two decades ago were done on athletic performance. So strength training, great for explosive power, great for strength, you know, good for football players or baseball players. But we didn't have any that studied strength training for cognitive function, uh, blood lipids, fat loss, heart health, but we have them now. And the data now is very clear. Strength training is the most effective form of exercise for pure fat loss. So when I say fat loss, by the way, I'm not talking about weight loss because you could lose 20 pounds, half of it can be muscle and you end up just being a smaller, slower metabolism, same flabbiness version of yourself, right? Resistance training leads to pure fat loss. And in most cases you get some muscle gain with that, which we could talk about. Some people are afraid of that. They think, oh, if I gain muscle, I'm gonna look bulky and big. Not true, you're just much more sculpted and have a better shape to your body. Um, studies on heart health show that strength training is at least as beneficial as cardiovascular exercise for heart health. Now, of course, the best combination, again, I wanna be clear, the best forms or way to work out if you have the time and you are dedicated is to combine a lot of different forms of exercise. But we're talking head to head and we're, I'm also talking to, again, the average person that's probably only going to do a couple days a week of exercise consistently, right? Um, cognitive function. Here's where it gets really interesting. There was a study out of Sydney, Australia that looked at strength training and Alzheimer's. And it was the only, this is one of the only times we've ever seen a non-medical intervention stop, slow down and stop the progression of the beta amyloid plaques mm. um, that, that lead to, or at least contribute to the symptoms of Alzheimer's. How is that possible? Probably, and this is a really interesting point here, probably because one of the most effective ways to improve insulin sensitivity is to simply build muscle. And Alzheimer's and dementia, some researchers will even refer to as type 3 diabetes. You'll see that it's, you know, there's something connected there where, and this is why when you put people on Alzheimer's on a ketogenic diet, you tend to see some improvements because there's a dysfunction there with utilizing glucose for energy. So you improve insulin sensitivity you tend to improve uh, cognitive function. Well, you gain a little bit of muscle and you see in tremendous improvements in insulin sensitivity. There's, there's studies on uh, severely obese individuals where they don't even have them lose weight. They just have them gain a little bit of muscle. 
and you see these, these great improvements in blood sugar and, and in insulin. Muscle is very insulin sensitive. Um, it's also one of the ways we store uh, glycogen, which is made from carbohydrates. So you got your liver that stores glycogen, and then you got your muscle. So you get more muscle, you have more ability to store, um, becomes more sensitive to it. Insulin is a very anabolic hormone. It actually contributes to muscle growth if you do it right. So, and there's, again, there's so much more, but we now finally have studies coming out that are showing like, wait a minute. One of my favorites is the strength studies that show how a simple strength test, like a grip test, that simple test right there will predict all cause mortality better than almost any other single metric. So like you could compare it to cholesterol or blood pressure or other metrics mm -hmm. and a grip test is more accurate in terms of all cause mortality. So strength is very important for longevity. Muscle is very protective. And thankfully now we're having the studies. And you know, I, I named the book, The Resistance Training Revolution. I think the revolution is gonna happen anyway. I think we're already starting to move in that direction because the data now is finally yeah. starting to confirm what those of us in fitness have seen for, for decades now. Yeah, man, thank you so much for bringing that up because we tend to put things into isolation. Mm -hmm. You know, It's just, again, another way that we're taught. So we don't really think about muscles connecting to the brain, yes. for example. But this is all happening in one sovereign unit, one sovereign human being. Yes. And I love this point because obviously insulin resistance, type two diabetes is beyond epidemic proportions oh, right yeah. now. We've got about 130 million Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic right now. It's insane. But we're also looking at Alzheimer's is now number six. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. And it's creeping its way into the top five. And most people have no idea about this, unless that they've been directly impacted by it with a family member. They're not even really aware of this, this epidemic. And the biggest proportion of these folks are folks who are insulin resistant and diabetic mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. It's like that it is the mega risk factor we're not talking about because the brain itself, there, there can be an insulin resistance taking place with your neurons, right? And so being able to improve that insulin sensitivity specifically in your brain by activating your muscles and the myokines released and all of these other metabolic benefits we're just now starting to understand because thank you for saying this, it's all happening right now. There's yeah. so many amazing studies on the stuff you've known for years coming out right now and it's affirming what we already know. Yeah, and it's, you know, um, when it comes to brain health, besides the insulin sensitizing effects, it's also there's also a very pro youth uh, hormone profile effect that comes from strength training. And it's a, it's a direct one. So first off, if you improve your health, generally you'll see a better hormone profile come out of it. So, you know, more optimal testosterone levels in men and in women, better estrogen progesterone ratios, growth hormone tends to get a little better, cortisol gets controlled a little better, insulin sensitivity. That's just from getting healthier, right? But only one form of exercise has been shown to directly influence hormones to make them look more youthful. And that's strength training. Now, why is that? Because the process of building muscle requires a youthful profile of hormones. It's very hard to build muscle as a man with low testosterone, right? So if you send this signal to build muscle and your body's like, we need to build muscle, one of the first things it does is it starts to raise testosterone and it starts to increase androgen receptor density. Now, what does this mean for the brain? Well, look at the studies on high cortisol and brain function, low testosterone and brain function, uh, uh, estrogen and progesterone imbalances um, and brain function, right? So there's that as well. And then there's a fourth piece, which is the, uh, the proprioceptive effects of strength training. So proprioception refers to my uh, ability to, to navigate through space, knowing where my body is in space, okay? So like an extreme example would be like a, a Olympic diver. You know, they jump off the platform and they spin and somehow they end up diving head first, right? So incredible proprioceptive ability. Well, of all the traditional forms of exercise, because strength training encourages multiplanar movements, you know, there's a, there's a million and one different strength training exercises and there's, you know, 10 different ways to do each one. It's not like running where I'm going in the same direction yeah. or cycling, which is the same motion over and over. Or is gumping it. Strength, yes, exactly. Strength training is I'm pressing up to the front. I'm going laterally. I'm rotating. I'm rowing. It requires a presence of mind. You know, when you're doing a barbell squat, you know, it's not like I'm thinking about my argument that I had earlier like I could when I'm on a treadmill. I got to think about this next <laughs> 10 reps that I'm doing. So it also trains this pro proprioceptive ability 
in the brain. So when it comes to strengthening the brain um, or uh, our cognitive abilities or preventing um, things like dementia and Alzheimer's, strength training is uh, head and shoulders. You know, part of the, the challenge, by the way, because we're talking about how this is all moving this direction, we have to erase and counter uh, the myths that surround strength training and the, you know, the way that it's been viewed for so long. Like if you talk to the average person about resistance training, the, you know, images of big bodybuilders pop up and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and they don't think about this healthy person living a long time. So that's part of the challenge. And then if you talk to women, although this is far less uh, evident today than it was 20 years ago, yeah. still I get women that tell me, oh, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna get bulky. I'm not yeah. trying to look masculine, you know, as if that could happen overnight, right? Yeah. Um, but but that's still the case. So it's we're still it's still uphill. Yeah. But thankfully, I think we're starting to see some headwinds. Yeah. This is so awesome, man. Because you know, I've I'm almost in September is going to be my 20th year when I started in, in health and fitness, and I was working at the university gym, and the first we'll just say three of the five or maybe four of my five first clients were women. Hmm. And it was that same tagline. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get bulky. Yeah. I don't want to get bulky, Sean. You yeah. see these thighs. I don't want to get bulky. Yeah. Right. And so of course we've seen that evolve over time to where it's not as common, but it's still a part of yeah. the public psyche. It still is. But, um, and I, this is leading to, I want to ask you about that beginning because mm. there's something that sparked this. Like we, we were talking about before we got started, when you, got into this field, he's like, oh, this is this is the yeah. thing. This is for me. So number one, when did you first s s fall in love with fitness? Like, you know, it's kind of like this, um, you know, uh, that movie Brown Sugar is just like, when did you first fall in love with hip hop? Yeah. But like, when did you fall in love with fitness? And when did you start working in the gym? Because you were crazy young. Yeah, I so I started working out um, and training my body for the same reasons I think a lot of people do. I had some insecurities about, you know, my body image. I was a skinny kid. And I wanted to build a stronger, more muscular body. My dad was very athletic. I'm not very athletic, much more of a book uh, worm. Uh, we had a weight set in the, in the backyard and I finally got the green light from my parents because I wanted to start much earlier, but they said, no, you're too young. At the age of 14, they said, okay, you can go start working out. And I fell in love with it right away. It was a very growth oriented, and I don't mean physical growth, but you know, you, it's a personal growth. Fitness is personal growth, it really is. You, you embark on that journey long enough and you end up touching almost every part of your life. But I, I really love that. And I became a nerd about it. So I was working out in the backyard. I bought every book and magazine. I mean, I subscribed to every magazine uh, that I possibly could. I went to the library, read books on Soviet studies, on weightlifting and chemistry books. So I could learn about supplement. I just love, absolutely loved it. One, I knew I wanted to work with fitness in some way. The only career I knew at the time, though, that was somewhat related was physical therapy. I had no idea that you could really make a career in gyms. So I wanted to do physical therapy. And I worked out uh, when I was 16, I finally got a membership at a gym, because that's when I had a license, so I could drive there. And I asked them if I could work there. And they said, you have to be 18. So I said, Okay, so I waited a couple years. As soon as I turned 18, I went in there. And I thought this is a great place to work uh, to while I go to school for physical therapy. So I went got a job as a personal trainer. And right away, it was like, this is where I belong. I mean, within four months, I was managing the fitness department. And within another uh, less than a year, I was a general manager. And at that point, I knew I wanted to be in the gym and not in the clinical medical setting. I loved the atmosphere. I loved working in that fast paced environment. I loved working with lots of people. And I just totally fell in love with it. And I, I, I worked for 24 Hour Fitness for a couple of years, grand open some of their clubs in the Bay Area. Um, and then I went off on my own. I, I bought um, a, a large gym with some partners, sold that. And then I had a wellness studio and I did that for about 13 years before I met my current partners and started Mind Pump. Um, and in the wellness studio, this is where I really learned uh, what I know about fitness. I had, um, I was at that time when I first started the wellness studio, I was very much the fitness guy. So I knew strength training, cardio, you know, flexibility training, and I knew macros and calories. Uh, and that was it. But in my studio, I had hormone specialists, um, I had a functional medicine practitioner in there, acupuncturist, body work specialist, because I knew that they would bring value. And just through osmosis, you know, I just learned mm -hmm. watching that because I could see what they were doing with my clients because we shared clients, right? So my clients would come in, they'd see me and then 
I'd have them go see the hormone specialist or go have them get, you know, gut tested and, and I'd see the benefits. I was like, okay, there's much more to fitness than I thought. And then I had my own um, kind of health issue pop up in my early 30s. I had some gut issues that got really, really bad. Thought I had uh, at one point, maybe I had Crohn's or, or some autoimmune issue. Um, and I got help from the people I worked with. I sat down with them and I said, you know, everything I know about fitness isn't working. I think I'm eating healthy, but I've got these gut issues. Can't figure it out. I'm losing weight. I don't feel good. And I completely revamped the way I approached exercise. I reduced the intensity and I looked at uh, fitness now as a way to become healthy, not just to look good. Mm. Um, and through about a year uh, of doing that, I uh, improved my health, actually looked better than I ever looked before. I remember when I first realized that too, it was probably a year later. And I had really avoided mirrors because it was such a trigger. If I looked in the mirror, then I'd want to go train a particular way mm. that was not uh, working for my health. But it was about a year later and, and I kind of looked at myself and said, oh, this is weird. I look better than I've ever looked. And then that's when I realized, you know, um, one of the best side effects of being healthy is you look good. But if right. I'm always trying to look good, I might not improve my health, in which case I'll lose both. And that really shaped the kind of the voice that you hear on my podcast, Mind Pump now, is that kind of that holistic approach. Yeah, man, that's amazing. Such a powerful story. So I want to ask you about, you know, you becoming a GM so young yeah. for, you know, some kind of, you know, big franchise gyms so you've got people who are working for you basically they're under you what was that dynamic like like oh. be, to have a kid who's my boss <laughs> yeah. like did you ever run into some conflicts i was so fortunate to work for 24 hour fitness during those years we're talking late 90s early 2000s so this is late 90s so it was 19 i want to say 97 or 98 when i started there and this was right after 24 hour nautilus merged with Ray Wilson's Family Fitness. So, um, you know, stop me if I get too far in the weeds here, but uh, both companies really revolutionized the gym business. They're the ones that created the gym business. Before that, if you owned a gym, it was like, you know, some meatheads worked out. You don't really profit that much. Not really a big business. Those two companies really put together like the EFT model. You know, like now you go to the gym, you get, they bill you every month out of your, your bank account. Well, they're the ones that, that brought that forth first. They had this kind of their approach to sales and marketing and building these these huge businesses. So they merged. Mark Masteroff, the owner of Nautilus, then became the you know obviously ran Twenty Four Fitness, which now at this time had 170 locations, which was massive back then. And he's just uh, he's the godfather of the fitness space. He uh, he now owns all the UFC gyms and Crunch gyms and all that. Anyway, it was a it was a great time working there, learning from them. And being a GM at, at you know, 19, I didn't tell anybody my age. Okay. So I walked in and people thought I was late 20s, early 30s, just the way I think I presented myself. I, got, I remember when I got found out, I had, this is when I was running the club in Sunnyvale and I had just turned 21 and there's a bar like two doors down from the gym and I took some of my sales guys and trainers and said, hey, let's go to the bar because uh, I'm going to celebrate my birthday. So we go in there, they check my ID and they're like, hey, happy birthday, you finally turned 21. And you should have seen the, the looks <laughs> on their faces. 21, I thought you were like 30, man. So no, I just turned 21. But by that point I had earned their respect. And, mm. But I, yeah, I made sure not to let them know I was you know, a 19 year old kid because my, my staff is all, they were all much older than me. Man, that's a great, great story, man. Um, so I want to circle back and talk about another really great insight that you put into the book because you've seen this firsthand, but also it's what the data indicates. People in our culture, there are, there are literally right now tens of millions of people who are on diets, mm -hmm. weight loss protocols, yeah. exercising, dieting, calorie restriction. I'm just talking about in America yeah. alone. And they usually see the needle move mm -hmm. in the direction that they want for a short amount of time then what typically happens is they regain that weight yeah. and oftentimes a little bit more. You said in the book that we don't have a weight loss problem, we have a keeping the weight off problem. Yeah, that's true. Talk about that. Yeah, so most uh, people lose weight throughout their lives through some method, diet, uh, diet and exercise combination. 
but the fail rate is north of 85%. Um, and I would say even higher than that if you stretch out the time long enough. So in the first couple of years, 85% fail. I bet if you go out to five or six years, you're probably looking at 95% plus. So everybody fails. Well, why is that? Because we view health and fitness or weight loss very mechanistically. We look at these pieces and parts and say, okay, if I just don't eat this, eat that, watch my calories, do this, then it's going to work. And there's some truth to that. It's true. If you do all those things, then you're going to get some of these results. The problem is that's not how you, humans work. We're behavior based creatures. We're not robots where you plug in, go do this. And I remember learning this as a trainer. And by the way, the first five years I trained people, I was terrible. I had to learn this the hard way. I would give people meal plans and tell them, you know, you're going to come in and do, you know, five days a week with me and we'd get great success for three or six months. And then I'd lose them and then I'd have to go get a new client. And eventually I, I asked myself, am I really doing a good job? Like I'm winning these awards for sales and all this stuff, but everybody's gaining the weight back. Like, what am I doing wrong? And it's because we're, we're viewing humans like they're robots and they're not, they're, they're, we're behavior based. So when you look at this, you have to, you have to understand that nutrition in particular or diet in particular, it's, it's, it, these are fundamental behaviors that we have. It's part of who we are. Like look at food, for example. Food is culture, food is celebration, it's morning, it's, you know, we got breakfast foods, lunch foods, dinner foods. We eat for a lot of different reasons, one of which is because we're hungry, which is actually way down the totem pole. We typically eat because we're bored or it's time to eat or I'm going to hang out with somebody and connect or uh, it tastes good and it feels good. So we have to look at that. That's what we have to look at if we want to make permanent fundamental changes. And then the second piece of that is understanding that when you're making fundamental changes to your life that you want to last forever, it's not going to happen all at once. Nothing happens all at once, unless you have an epiphany, which is extremely rare. I mean, I've seen people get heart attacks and cancer, and that still didn't give them the epiphany to radically change their lives. So then how do we change our lives or the direction of our lives in fundamental ways? Very slowly. And we have to develop the skill of discipline over time and stop relying on the state of mind known as motivation. Motivation is a great state of mind. I love it. Everybody loves being motivated. But I never had to convince a client to work out or eat right when they were motivated. Everybody can do that when they feel like it. It's when they don't, which inevitably you're going to get into those states of mind as well. So we have to develop behaviors and habits that can move us in that direction. And there's a lot of different ways to do this that I've identified that are, that are far more successful. But just kind of in a nutshell, you want to ask yourself the following. What's one small step that I can take now that is uh, challenging, it needs to be somewhat challenging, otherwise it has no meaning, but also, and here's the context, realistic forever. What can I do now? What change can I do now that is going to be kind of hard, but I feel confident that I can maintain forever? forever right shout out to sandlot That's which it. we talked about before yes, the show. yes so and and uh, you have to say that because when people tend to want to tackle this they're in a motivated state of mind so i don't know if, if you've ever done this but i've done this in business right where i'm all motivated and i'm like all right here's my goal i'm gonna work you know 15 hours a day and then I'm like, wait a minute is this gonna last when that motivation fades so you have to you have to say forever whatever that is is the right there is no wrong answer here. it can be anything so it can literally be um, I'm going to walk five minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or I'm going to add a glass of water every single day. I had a client do that once. You know, that's where we started glass of water. No problem. Cause all she drank was diet Coke. Let's add a glass of water. Let's start there. So you start there. And then when that becomes a behavior, then you ask yourself again, what's the next step I can take that is challenging, but realistic for me forever. And what ends up happening is the steps you take as you go along start to become bigger and bigger. And the, and the time in between the steps starts to get shorter and shorter as you start to develop this skill of discipline. So I'll give you a, a great story. I have a client, I've talked about her so many times on the show, so I'm sure she's heard by now, but I love using her as an example because um, she it just fit so perfectly. So at one point when I had my wellness studio, uh, my wellness studio was a, a couple miles away from a hospital and at one point I had developed a re reputation and I had started training a lot of doctors, doctors and surgeons. So they would come train me and every once in a while they'd send me one of their patients. Well, one of my clients was a general surgeon, wonderful lady. And she 
told me, hey, I'm going to send you a patient who just beat cancer. And um, she really doesn't want to come here. But I keep harping on her. And her and I have a good relationship. So she finally agreed. But I just want to warn you, she really doesn't want to do this. I said, no problem. I have no problem with that. So in comes in Kelly. And first words out of her mouth. I'm going to work out once a week. I'm not going to do anything on my own. And I'm going to change my diet. So what can we do with that? Now, the you know inexperienced old trainer, you know, young trainer, I should say, would have said, no, you got to come in three days a week at least. You know, we got to change diet and I'm very charismatic and motivational. Maybe I would have convinced her, but that would have eventually failed. But the older, wiser me said, yeah, no problem. Once a week's perfect. It's more than you're doing now. And we can definitely get you stronger and see some changes once a week. And you'll definitely feel better working out once a week. And that's what we did. But I knew mm -hmm. that her coming in once a week, seeing me, and me not making a big deal about it and having it a good time when she'd come in and, you know, making it a great place for her and her feeling stronger and seeing some of the effects. I knew eventually she would want to do more. And she did. It was a year later, literally. So for a year, I trained her for once a week. And I knew she, I know she showed up because she liked the conversations we would have, which is fine. So she'd show up. We have a good conversation. But I trained in the meantime. A year later, she comes in and she goes, hey, Sal, do you have another another day a week that I could train with you? Absolutely, Kelly. Let's do two days a week. And we did that. Four months later, are there any exercises I could do at home while I'm grading paper? She was a professor. Hmm. And I said, yeah, let me show you uh, three mobility movements you could do on the ground that you know are really easy and you can just add them to your daily activity. A few months later, you know, I think I'd like to cut my sugar intake down. Well, anyway, three years later, she was a bona fide fitness fanatic. I mean, she actually got a certification in personal training for her own education. Wow. And I mean, this is, I haven't trained this woman for 10 years and I still keep in contact with her and she's still exercising. She loves it. Now, had I pushed and convinced her to come three, four days a week and make all these crazy changes and yeah, you got to do this with your diet and you got to do this with your exercise and you got to do this with your sleep and you got to, and they're throwing everything at her, she would have been gone. No way. She would have lasted three months and then she would have been gone. So that's the the sustainable approach. And you all you want to ask yourself, can I maintain this forever? The one of the things I love so much about strength training is for most people, two days a week done properly, you'll build muscle and strength and you'll positively affect your metabolism in ways where you'll burn more calories every single day. So it's not asking a lot out of you. And you don't have to train like a bodybuilder six days a week or do anything crazy. Two days a week, two days a week, you can go really, really far to improving your health and making things far more sustainable from a fat loss and health perspective. That's why I like it so much. It's like, it only needs this much time to get this much back. And let's be honest, when we're talking about the average person, what we don't want to do is make a prescription that requires a ton of time and gives them only this much in return. Yeah, man, that's such a great story because that was a moment that literally she had a, there was a fork in the road type moment where she could have went a totally different direction. Totally if you pushed back against what her intention was at that time. But you said, you know, your experience, the older, wiser you, you, you Yoda'd her or Jedi, Jedi her. <laughs> and you know, that reminds me of that. What was it? Uh, do or do not. There is no try, yeah. you know, shout yeah. out to, shout out to yo, shout out to baby Yoda. Yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact. Yeah. Baby Yoda is great. Gro it's, is my, it Groku? Groku. Groku. Yeah. My daughter loves uh, yeah. Groku. You know, um, I, it's a great story and it's it's a true story, but there's a lot of clients before that that I did, I just didn't do it. I did it wrong. And I had, I remember blowing one lady out the water where she, she wasn't progressing. And I thought, you know, as an early trainer, it's my job to make you do what you need to do. And I had this real tough conversation with her and she left and she was in tears and I was so proud of myself and she never came back. Mm. She never came back. I still feel bad about it uh, to this day. Um, you know, we, those of us in, in this space have to realize that we're guides and that we're not talking, you know, when I'm talking like on a show like this, I'm not talking to myself. I'm a fitness fanatic. I mean, you could tell me, you know, you could tell me to do almost anything. If there's gonna be some kind of benefit physical, I'm probably going to try it and probably do it. We're talking to the average person. The average person isn't really interested in, in getting super shredded or performing like a professional athlete. They just want to have a better quality of life. They want to feel better. They want to be relatively lean. They want to be relatively healthy and fit. But they also want to have a lot of time to be with their kids and their families or do their jobs or do the other things that they enjoy. And so that's that's who we're communicating to. 
And we have to remember that. And so we have to use the most effective means to do so, which means what can you do that requires the least amount of time that's going to give you the best results? And, you know, I often I'm often careful when I say that, because when I say do less to get more, people think that means harder. In other words, OK, if I'm only doing 30 minutes, well, then I got to crawl out of this gym. I got to beat the crap out of myself and, you know, throw up. And then, yeah, now that 30 minutes is, is as effective as an hour. No, no, that's not the case. We want we want to induce adaptations that are beneficial. And what induces adaptations is appropriate exercise. It's dose dependent depending on the individual. There's like a, a bell curve, you know, too little, don't get any results. Right here is perfect, too much, and I get worse results. What tells us where we are in that? Your current fitness level, you know, what, what's your fitness level? Um, are you sore after your workout? Oh, you are? You probably went too hard. You probably shouldn't feel you know what you should feel after you work out more energy after you leave the gym you should feel better than you walked in i know that sounds crazy to people who go and beat themselves up but it's absolutely true i remember when i had that you know paradigm shattering realization and i started to really target like i want my clients to feel better when they leave and, my, and the results i mean people just got way better results uh, that way and that's really what you should aim for man that's so powerful man you know, you're just bringing up one of the most important points that we could ever talk about, which is we tend to think, again, it's the actions. It's the it's the things that we do, but it's really the psychology that precedes the things. 100%. Right? And understanding human psychology, you just laid it all out for us. If we don't understand that and relate to that and connect to that, I remember being a nutritionist. I was so focused on food and food was like everything. It was the gateway because it was for me, it was mm -hmm. a bridge for me, but there are many paths to the goal. But it took me years in clinical work to realize how much sleep mattered. And so when I started asking people about their sleep and hearing all these crazy stories, like I just couldn't believe, I realized something. Well, I, it pulled up from my experience in working in nutrition, working in the field. I knew that people want change, but they don't want to change that much. Yes, and you know, I'll give you a great example around this. Just, uh, and it's, again, it's, we have to understand our behaviors and our psychology. So I'll give you two scenarios, both resulting in the same result, but only one of them will result in, in long lasting, sustainable results. Okay, so let's say you're, you're, you're somebody who wants to lose weight. So you're like, okay, um, in order to lose weight, I need to eat less. So I could take a client, I could say, okay, you wanna lose weight? We're gonna have you eat 500 calories less a day. So I want you to track your calories, everything you eat. I want you to input it into this app. And you know, I want you to eat 1500 calories a day, every single day, cause that's 500 calories lower than what you're eating now. And that'll get you to lose weight. So that's one way to do it. Here's the other way to do it. I could tell a client, and this, I remember when I figured this out, it was such a light bulb moment. Hey, you know, here's the deal. Eat as much as you want, just avoid heavily processed food. So. Whole natural foods, eat until you're satisfied, okay? And then let's see what happens. They both result in about a 500 calorie deficit, okay? So study, and studies are very clear on this. It, heavily processed foods uh, result in about a five to 600 calorie increase in intake because they're so, they're so well engineered that they make you overeat. Now, on the one hand, I'm some, telling someone to cut their calories. Mm -hmm. The other one I'm saying, eat as much as you want, kind of avoid these foods here, but eat all the fruit and potato and vegetables and meat and you know rice and just whole natural foods go ahead and eat as much as you want which one do you think is more likely to be sustainable hmm. right and i remember when i'll tell clients that and they come in they lose weight they think there was some magical thing happening with the, yeah. with the, the food they're eating that's actually you're eating less calories here's another one i could tell someone to cut their calories by 10 to 15 percent or i could say i don't want you to change your food at all just try this when you eat don't be on your phone, don't watch TV, don't be distracted, just focus on your food. That results in about a 10, 15% decrease in calories, just not eating distracted. So and so those are behavior-based methods versus the mechanistic-based methods. That's the that's the only it's only gonna work if we do it that way. If we keep telling people, cut this, cut the, the calorie here, uh, these are the foods that are that are magical, these are the foods that are bad, um, don't eat carbs or only eat vegetables or it's, you know, we're going to fail. And in this, in the, the data is very clear. It's a 85% fail rate. So we have to change our approach and it's, it's behavior. It's, we got to focus on the behaviors hundred percent. 
a good tenet to remember is that humans, we don't like stuff taken away from us. Since we were babies, yes. don't take my <laughs> rattle away <laughs> yeah. or we're going to have a problem. Don't take my keys, you know, my baby keys. Don't take my binky. Yeah. You know, if another kid takes your thing, it's a problem. Like, there's something you have to socially learn. And we kind of have to, in a way, you know, not literally, but kind of beat it out of a kid to not be selfish, not to have this kind of this is mine attitude and to want to share. Now, there are dispositions. Some people have a more sharing spirit. But in general, we don't like stuff taken away from us, especially if it's our thing. Right. right. So that's number one. We've got to keep that in mind. We don't like having things taken away from us. And also, we don't like to be imprisoned. Mm -mm. And we don't realize this because, you know, we don't want to be told what to do, but we we actually have to create a psychological construct for ourselves to, to be told what to do. That's a whole other conversation. But in general, we don't want to be imprisoned in a certain way of being, thinking, that whole thing. So this is why it's such a strong punishment to imprison a human yeah. being. It's one of the most devastating things that you I, can do. I can tell you worked with a lot of people with nutrition because, um, I mean, what you just hit on is so powerful. So when the average person goes on a diet or changes their their nutrition to lose weight, what they're doing, what they typically will do psychologically, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, an example that'll kind of illustrate this. Somebody's on a diet, so they go to a party and their friend says, hey, you want some cookies? What do they say? No, I can't. Mm. What do you mean you can't? Who says you can't? Of course you can. Very weird, right? I remember when I first that first came to me, I thought, what do you mean you can't? That's kind of a weird thing to say. What's going on here? Here's what's happening psychologically. That person, well, first off, what motivated them to want to lose weight probably came from a form of self-hate. Look in the mirror. I'm gross. I'm not sexy. I'm not attractive. I don't like this, who I am. So uh, I need to change this because I don't like this, right? So what do they do? They split themselves into two people. The, the child that needs to be told what to do and the dictator or the oppressor that says, you can't have that cookie. You can't have that cookie. And so you offer the cookie and they say, I can't. And then eventually what happens? When you're oppressed long enough, when you got a dictator over you telling you long enough you can't do something, what do you do? You rebel. So what does it look like when people go off a diet? Do they have one cookie? They have a whole box, right? Uh, they, it's like it's like they don't just say, "Oh, I'll have that one cookie." They eat so many that they get sick to their stomach, and they go, "Gosh, that was why did I eat a whole a whole sleeve of Oreo cookies?" Right? So it's that right there is one of the big problems. Instead, what if we did this? What if we went into it from not a place of self hate, but rather self care, self love? So you look in the mirror and you say, "Wow, I haven't been living in a way." where I take care of myself the way I deserve to be taken care of. Just like I, just like my kids, like I take care of my kids. You know what I'm gonna start doing? I'm gonna start taking care of myself. I'm gonna start eating in a way that feeds me um, like I care about myself. So now when somebody offers you that cookie, you know what you say? I don't want it. Or I do, and I'll have one. That's how balance is created. You know, cause here's the thing mm -hmm. with food. Um, is it healthy to eat pizza? Sometimes. You know, if I haven't seen a friend for a long time and we meet up and it's been five years, it's like, hey, let's go get a pizza and have some beer. I could be having a very healthy interaction and bonding with my friend. Most of the time, I'll probably shouldn't eat pizza or don't eat pizza, right? So that, the way we enter into this makes the biggest difference in the world, especially when it comes to nutrition. And the same thing for the gym. If I go to the gym and think to myself, I hate myself, I hate how I look, I'm going to punish myself, what are my workouts going to look like? punishments. I'm going to beat myself up. I'm going to push myself till I feel like throwing up. I'm going to keep going till I'm sore because I deserve it because I'm, you know, undisciplined because I, I can't believe I look this way. What if I go to the gym and I say to myself, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to train far more appropriately. I'm going to go to the gym and say, what's going to feel good? What's good for me and my body right now? Right? I'm not going to use it as a form of punishment. I remember years ago, I was at a dinner. Um, my ex-wife, her, she worked at a tech company, and so they had this Christmas dinner. So I remember we were sitting at this big table with a lot of these coworkers, and um, you know, all the spouses are introducing each other, and you know, they come to me, hey, you know, what's your name? I'm Sal, and I'm a personal trainer. And right away, if you're in fitness, and you're in with non-fitness people, right away, people are like, oh, don't look what I'm eating, or oh, I'm only having. Yeah. Right away, it's this whole like thing, right? 
So I, I know, and I'm used to it. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to make people feel comfortable or whatever. But sure enough, the comments come, and you know, oh, don't look at me. I'm eating more bread or whatever. <laughs> so, and you, I'm sure you've experienced, yeah, it, right? yeah, so much. It's funny, right? So, yeah. um, so we're we're having dinner and we're doing that, and 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 one of the ladies, you know, after a few glasses of wine, she she pipes up and she goes, you know, Sal, she goes, I had a friend who uh, exercised every day, and she ate right, and then she got cancer and died when she was 50. So you know what I said after that? I'm just going to enjoy my life. And I remember thinking to myself, enjoy my life. Boy, people really view exercise and nutrition, eating healthy or eating in ways that improve our health as punishments. Like if you go to the gym because you hate yourself, of course it's enjoying your life when you stop, right? But how strange because name one thing that won't improve every aspect of your life more than improving your health. You become a better parent, become a better employee or boss. You're more innovative. You have better mental clarity. You're less anxious and less depressed. Really enjoying your life is being healthy and doing the things that make you healthy. And I remember sitting there and I was just, I was so, I was quiet for a good 15 minutes and I was thinking about this, like, enjoy my life. This is such a weird thing. I said, oh, I know why. She views exercise as a punishment and she views food as a restriction. We got to change that. We got to change that attitude. Yeah, man. This is, I love talking with you. There's so many similar stories. I remember, you know, on several occasions, but one particular person's jumping to mind. She came in, she sat in my office. I had her intake form, all the things. And she was like, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. Just don't take my bread away. <laughs> I'm like, Shit. Like, okay. Like this is already, she's already got in her mind that I'm here to take something from her yeah. that she enjoys. I'm here to take her joy away. Uh-huh. So we're already starting in this deficit. And so the big thing and what you do and what is clear that you're doing is reframing things Mm -hmm. because the craziest part is there's so much joy to be found in in these practices, but more so, this is the craziest thing too. And I, I understand this because again, I grew up there was a time when I ate fast food 300 plus days a year, Mm. like facts. And I understand what that's like. And so just the concept, I remember I said it to my, my, you know, I've got myself healthier and my little brother was around. He was like, I I heard you eating organic now. (laughs) He said it like organic was like, I don't know, like, I don't know, like covered. Like a weird cult or something. Yeah, like some covered lettuce or something. (laughs) Just like, but it's just, it's just a label on, I'm not eating food that has pesticides on them, right? Mm -hmm. So he assumes that it's gonna taste bad because it's grown better, yeah. right? So finding the joy, which here's the crazy thing, real food, there's so much pleasure and flavor experiences to be found within that context. And I'm circling back for a specific reason because you mentioned that one instructive element, which was, okay, we can force you to watch what you're eating, cut your cow, you gotta literally keep an eye on your, your yeah. bad, inner child self, cut your calories, or eat whatever you want. Just, you know, eat mostly like whole real food, stuff mm-hmm. that you can kind of still know where they come from, yeah. right? That one instructive element versus you constantly monitor yourself. And what happens is this group over here eating the real food naturally has this reduction in calorie intake. So right. you mentioned that, this is, this is a powerful piece. There's one other piece too. This study was published in the journal uh, Food and Nutrition Research and they had test subjects to either consume a meal of whole foods or a meal of processed mm-hmm. foods, right? And so it's, they were sandwiches still, which is you know questionable. So the whole food sandwich was whole grain bread and cheddar cheese, right? And the processed food sandwich was white bread and cheese product, which is you know Kraft Singles, yeah. which is not legally, they can't call it cheese, it's not enough cheese, cheese in product, cheese. Yeah. Cheese product, right? And so they tracked their caloric expenditure after eating these sandwiches same amount of calories in the sandwiches same protein fats carbohydrate on paper they're the same they should Mm -hmm. have the same metabolic impact but afterwards the people who ate the processed food sandwich when they ate the processed food sandwich the different test subjects they had a 50 percent reduction in caloric expenditure after eating that sandwich some kind of metabolic shift took place where their body was being more stingy and hanging on to that energy right so this is the point i want to bring to you which is people find it harder like if you're trying to gain weight for example which is where i want to shift the conversation Mm -hmm. to if you're trying to put on some muscle it's and i know this from past experience too 
much more difficult to gain weight now eating real whole foods because I'm just so satiated versus back when I was having all of these protein supplements and yeah. you know processed foods to gain weight. Yeah, um, we think there's this, this um, uh, belief and it's wrong that humans are eating machines that because we evolved where food was scarce that if you just put food in front of us, we'll eat until we kill ourselves. That's not true. We have palate fatigue that sets in and we have natural limiters that tell us when to stop eating. Now, heavily processed foods hijack these systems of satiety, right? They, they, they are designed to do so. Like, I'll give you an example. I remember I had Chris Kresser on the podcast and he gave me this example. I loved it because it illustrates it so well. If I gave you five whole boiled plain potatoes, so I took five potatoes, boiled them, no salt, no butter, gave them to you and said, here, eat this in 45 minutes. You probably couldn't do it. You get through two p potatoes and you gag. You're like, I can't, I can't finish this. But if I gave you a family size bag of Lay's potato chips, you could probably do it, which contains about the same amount of potatoes, except there's actually more calories in the bag of Lay's potato chips. Now, why is that? Because the Lay's potato chips or the processed version is engineered to make you eat more. If you look at the research and development that goes into processed foods, the vast majority, the vast majority of the research and development goes into making them as irresistible as possible. And it's everything. It's not just taste. It's mouthfeel. It's the sound it makes when you crunch in your mouth. It's the residue it leaves on your fingerprints. It's the color of the bag. It's the smell. It's the commercials and the, and the way that it, it presents this food to you. And so, again, some of the best studies you'll find, by the way, nutrition studies are tough because many of them are observational and self-reported, which is just notoriously inaccurate, right? Meaning people will come in and, and write down what they ate over the last week and it's, people are always off, right? Well, these studies on pre processed foods were amazing. They're controlled. They had people, they took groups of people, put them in rooms and said, you over here, eat as much as you want. And you over here, eat as much as you want. Only difference is these are whole natural foods over here. And these are heavily processed foods. And they even controlled them for macros. So the macros were even very similar, proteins, fats, and carbs. Then they took the groups after a little while and they switched rooms. So they took this group, put them in this room, this group, put them in that room. Five to 600 more calories people on average will consume with heavily processed foods because they're again engineered and designed to overcome uh, systems of satiety but you know there's more to, to it than just that so that's important it's important to understand but there's more to it because we've grown up in such abundance and because we've grown up in modern western societies with markets and markets are exceptional but they do one thing and this is good and bad sometimes they give us what we want and what we want is convenience and we want hedonistic pleasure when it comes to food right so because we've grown up that way, we've learned to value food for one thing. It's hedonistic pleasure. The, val the, the value that we place on, you, you talk to anybody, hey, what do you want to have for lunch? And they'll go down the list. Oh, Mexican, nah, I'm feeling like Chinese. Nah, what about pizza? Oh, I got this burger place or whatever, right? It's all about that hedonistic uh, pleasure. There's so many other values to food that you can learn to appreciate that then will motivate you to eat differently. I'll give you a silly, here's a silly, Silly example. Um, what place do you crave popcorn the most? At the movies. Movies. <laughs> yeah. Is popcorn that good? Nah, I mean, I never really want popcorn, but I'm at the movies. I feel like eating popcorn. We've conditioned ourselves through uh, through that process, right? I know there was a, uh, as a kid, I remember one time when I was, I was sick, I had to stay home from school. My mom took me to my grandma's house and my grandmother is, she's an immigrant um, from Sicily. And Sicilian grandmothers or Italian grandmothers, basically, when it comes to food, they'll give you whatever you want <laughs> and they'll give you a lot of it. Right. So I remember I was like, she took me to the grocery store and she said, and I was, you know, wasn't feeling too good. And she said, hey, what do you want? Get whatever you want. And I saw this box of crackers and it had a chicken on it and it was called chicken and a biscuit. I think they still make them. And I said, I want those. Right. And I was, I was young. I was probably like eight years old. So she bought them for me and I liked them and I ate them every time I felt sick till this day. I still like them because of that association. Now, objectively, they're not very good. They taste gross. It's like chicken soup crackers mm -hmm. is what they taste like. Yeah. But I had that association, okay? I'll give you another example. Uh, in my early 20s, I went to go visit family in Southern Italy. And at this point, I was getting more and more into fitness. And I remember reading some articles about omega-3 fatty acids and how fish could help the muscle building process. This is when I was like, all I cared about was getting building muscle and looking a particular way and I hated fish I hated fish but I was going to southern Italy and they eat a lot of fish over there and I said you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna eat a lot of fish and see how much muscle I can put on so I went over there and I opened 
my mind and ate a lot of fish and actually started to enjoy it, start to feel good, associated the two. Now I like eating fish. I did the same thing with vegetables. So what does this mean for the average person? When you eat a food, we're already aware of its hedonistic value, the pleasure. Make yourself aware of its other values. How do you feel before, during, and after? How's your digestion? How's your energy? How's your mood? What does this do for you? And pay attention to those things. And at first it's gonna be conscious. At first you have to be conscious of these benefits. You have to kind of think about them. But eventually those benefits uh, start to solidify, become unconscious, and then you'll find yourself craving some of these foods. Like I crave vegetables now, not because vegetables are delicious, but because they help my digestion. And I identified that a long time ago. And now when I travel and I go home, because you know when you travel, it's hard to get really good vegetables, right? When I go home, what do I want the most? A big bowl of vegetables, right? So you can do this with yourself through that process. And for people who, who think uh, or listening to this and saying, oh, that, that doesn't make sense. Look, um, if you've ever eaten a lot of candy and then tried to go eat a piece of fruit, you know how it can change how you view, how your body perceives food, right? You eat a lot of candy, go eat a strawberry, it tastes bland. Don't eat candy for a long time, go eat a strawberry. It's going to taste very sweet. You can change how you perceive what you eat, how you enjoy what you eat. And it's not just it's hedonistic pleasure, but rather how it makes you feel, the people you're bonding with over it. I mean, there's foods I like to eat just because, you know, I, I, I have good relationships with people when I eat them. You know, like I said, I come from a traditional Italian family and I have family members that make these traditional dishes and the only time we have them is when we're all together so that's why i value that particular dish or whatever you can do this with yourself over time and like i said earlier in the, in our conversation this slow process this step-by-step -step process will lead you to the sustainable because this is the only sustainable approach or the only sustainable place to be is, is this right here i'll paint it where eating healthy is what you want to do it's not stressful mm -hmm. i enjoy it and there's balance. And when I enjoy eating something because it tastes real good, I'm actually enjoying it for that one thing and I'm not gorging or binging. You ever pay attention to when, you know, I remember when I was younger and I would go on these like diets to get shredded and then afterwards I'd go off of them and then, you know, just eat whatever. I remember one time I was eating uh, potato chips and I was eating them so fast that I wasn't even paying attention to the one that was in my mouth. It was about the one that was in my hand. And I remember thinking to myself like, this is really weird. I like the taste, but I'm not even thinking about the taste. I'm thinking about the one that's in my hand, right? You want to be in this place where eating healthy and balanced is what you want to do, where exercising occasionally is what you want to do to take care of yourself. Now, because you want to do it, because you value it that way, you're going to do it forever. You're going to always do it. If you don't get to that place, boy, is it going to be a struggle. And either you're going to have to become a fanatic, which good luck, uh, or you're going to fall off, which is what happens to everybody. Yeah, man, so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. You know, again, this, th what you're doing is directing us to the ability that we have to, and this is called, you know, when people say I'm working on myself, but you have the ability to change how you perceive things. You have the ability to change your inner dynamics. And so to circle back to the resistance training revolution, you know, earlier when I mentioned that study with processed food changing yeah. the way your metabolism works, you know, it's it's a step above. It's this term that I'm pushing in a culture called epicaloric controller, mm. right? And so we've got nutrition is one aspect, but also muscle is an epicaloric controller. It changes the way your body processes energy. So let's shift gears to muscle being an endocrine organ yeah. and why this is something for us to focus more on. Right now, leaving from this episode, something for us to put more intention on building in our lives. Yeah, so um, so first off, I wanna say this, just to, just in case there's still any questions. Uh, muscle's very dense, doesn't take up a lot of space. So I'm, if there's someone still watching right now says, oh, I don't wanna get any bigger though, I'm trying to lose weight. If you lost 10 pounds of body fat and gained 10 pounds of muscle, you would lose about one fourth to one third of the size on your body because muscle takes up less space, okay? so. Get that out of your head right now. Building muscle isn't getting bigger. You have to build a lot of muscle to really get bigger. You'll just feel tighter, more sculpted. So now that we've established that, okay. Muscle uh, makes up in, in, mo in many men up to 40% uh, of our bodies. It's, a, it's, a, it's an organ, it's massive, and it's expensive. Expensive, it's calorically expensive, okay? 
for your body simply to maintain a pound of muscle, it must burn more calories than it takes to maintain a pound of body fat. And telling your body to prioritize muscle and telling your body that you need to be stronger moves your metabolism in a less efficient way. So why am I saying that? Because I'll get people that will message me and say, oh, but this study shows that one pound of muscle only burns an extra 15 cal, as if that was nothing, by the way, but only builds, you know, burns an extra 15 calories. It's way more complex than that. The human metabolism or mammalian metabolism is one of the most complex things that we've identified, probably second to the brain. You have a range of calories that your body will burn with your current lean body mass, meaning you don't have to gain more or lose muscle. There's a range. And my lifestyle can make it more efficient, burn less, or less efficient, burn more. So like losing sleep, being stressed out, my body tends to want to store calories, right? Being more relaxed, getting good sleep, feeling healthy, tends to burn more calories. Hormones could do the same thing. Optimal testosterone levels, burn more. Low testosterone levels, burn less. Same lean body mass. So simply telling my body through exercise, through proper strength training, we need strength and we need muscle. Feeding my body appropriately, meaning I'm not cutting my calories so low where I can't, where my body's like, I don't care what signal you're sending me, we're starving. So I'm giving myself enough calories. I'm getting the adequate proteins in particular and fats in particular, those are essential. I don't have any nutrient deficiencies. Feeding my body appropriately, getting good sleep, bad sleep will also push it in the other direction. When I do that, my body becomes less efficient with calories. Then you add a little bit of muscle on top of that, you know, four or five pounds of muscle, which you're just gonna feel tighter in your body. You're looking at a significant difference in your metabolic rate. Um, I mean, on average, in my experience, I get I can get women's metabolism to boost by four to 600 calories a day. I mean, I've had way more than that, but on average, four to 600 calories a day, that's like two hours of cardio. This is not talked about. No. This is not talked about because again, you know, going to a conventional university, this calories in, calories out paradigm, which is again, this is very simplistic. We're mm -hmm. not looking at all the mechanistic things that control how your body's processing these calories. Right. You just shared an example of literally shifting somebody's metabolism to the point that they're just naturally burning more calories. Four, I guess at four to six hundred was would be my average with a with a female client. That's that's two hours of cardio. Imagine if you if you burn the calories of doing two hours of cardio every day, but you're not. Just automatic. You just burn them, right? Just on automatic. With men, yeah. it's usually I've seen you know between six to eight hundred. Now in extreme cases, I've seen much higher. I mean, I had this one woman who hired me who, she was a stage presentation competitor, so she did uh, figure competitions. And if, if if you're familiar with that, the, the amount of dieting and stuff that's so extreme, right, leading into that, and she did it all the wrong ways, like overtrained her body cut her calories. She did a few shows in a row. And she came to me because she was trying to get ready for a show. And she's like, I can't get this last eight pounds off. I'm doing two hours of cardio a day. I'm doing uh, strength training three days a week. I've cut my calories. I'm at 1200 calories. She's like, what do I do? Do I go down to 900 calories? Like, I, I don't want to do that. I'm already feeling terrible. I said, no, first off, cancel the show. And what we're going to do is we're going to reduce your, I'm going to cut your cardio way down. And we're going to slowly get you to focus on strength. And we're going to feed your body to build strength. Let's just focus on getting stronger for now. Well, over the course of a year, I got her to, from burning 1,200 calories with all that cardio, all that activity. She was eating 2,300 calories a day, lifting weights three days a week. And doing almost no cardio activity except for walking. That's a big difference. That's over 1,000 calories that her body wanted to burn on its own, mm -hmm. right? So you can do this with yourself. You just have to send the right signals to your body. If you send the wrong signals, you go in the opposite direction. You don't want to be in a position where you lose weight and you're eating half as much as you were before. Now you're going to maintain it plus do all this extra activity. It's not going to happen. So how do we do it? How do we do it, Sal? <laughs> like what are some best practices for resistance training? Okay, so here's a really good one. When you go to the gym, first off, you want to pick the most effective exercises, the ones that give you the most bang for your buck. There's a lot of strength training exercises but the most effective ones are known as gross motor movement exercises or compound exercises. Okay, so your horizontal presses, so like a push-up or a bench press or a machine press. Rowing is really good, like a barbell row or a band row or a cable row or a body row. Some kind of an overhead press. So you can do with dumbbells or cables or bands. Um, some kind of a squat. It can either be a split stance squat like a lunge 
or a traditional squat or of course barbell squats um, deadlifts you want to lift things off the ground maybe some kind of a rotation really pick like five maybe four or five exercises like that that you that you have found that you say okay i'm gonna i'm gonna do these four or five exercises now what you want to do is you want to go to the gym and here's a, here, this is real important you want to practice those exercises don't go to the gym to work out i know this sounds crazy right now go to the gym to practice we tend to view exercise like um like it's not a skill okay i remember years ago i was hiking up in the foothills by up in uh where i'm at up in san jose and i'm hiking and people would run by me people who are running and I'm, as a trainer it's really hard for me not to notice biomechanics right so people are running by and i'm like oh my gosh that guy's feet are pronating so bad or oh that person's anterior pelvic tail their back's gonna hurt right and then all of a sudden this guy ran by and he looked like a gazelle he just ran so smoothly and i thought to myself like you know why that is because all those other people said to themselves i'm gonna lose weight they put on some shoes and they just went run until they got tired they didn't consider the fact that running is a skill they probably forgot that skill when they were 10 and they stopped running and they're just this is why they hurt themselves i'm like oh my gosh this is so true with strength training people go to the gym and they don't say i'm going to get better at squatting they say i'm going to hammer my legs mm -hmm. right they don't say i'm going to get better at pressing they say i'm going to hammer my arms or my shoulders so don't do that instead go to the gym and practice the skill of the exercises practice and get better at doing those exercises better and more perfect and more stable and more controlled and go ahead and challenge yourself a little bit but challenge yourself with the skill more than the weight that you're lifting and the intensity that'll lead you in the right direction the second part is you got to leave the gym feeling better than you went in uh to the gym with so if you if you leave the gym and you feel like you're crawling to your car or you got to go take a nap you went too hard too hard so the way the body adapts with exercise is you exercise is a is a stress on the body then the body says, okay, we need to recover from the stress. And then we need to adapt so that next time the same insult doesn't produce the same stress. So this is why you get stronger. The problem is, is when we, when the stress is too high for our body, our bodies can't adapt. It only focuses on healing or recovering. Recovery and adaptation are two separate things. They, they, they happen simultaneously often, but they're both very different. So it's like if I took a piece of sandpaper and rub my hand until uh, you know I got through the skin and I let the skin heal, but then I waited a little longer and I started to develop a little bit of a callus. And over time I developed a real thick callus, right? So that's adaptation. But if I keep rubbing the skin, as soon as it comes back, I'm never gonna get that callus, I'm just healing. This is what a lot of people do when they go to the gym, they get sore, then they're not sore and they go back and get sore and they're not sore and they never get stronger, they never really improve. So you wanna go and you wanna feel better afterwards and what you're looking for are improvements in your technique and your form and your strength. If that's moving in that direction, the positive direction, you're going in the right way. If you're just sweating and getting sore, those are terrible ways to judge uh, an effective workout. And for most people, two days a week of this will get you very far. If you do this right, it'll get you very, very far. You want to add a third, a third day? Phenomenal. You want to add a fourth day? Great. But I'd say start with one or two days a week, full body, four or five exercises, practice them feel good at the end of the workout a little bit of soreness is fine no soreness is is perfect and just get better at those exercises over time and your body will improve as you do so awesome awesome so a little bit more advanced question that adaptation you know just say somebody's skilled they've already you know they, they've practiced they've got that under their belt and you know maybe they're you know lifting certain muscle groups in a, in a day yeah how how many times should they be targeting that particular muscle group so for example if it is chest and shoulders yeah. should we be going you know twice a week or maybe a following week or longer what is that look so like? uh, they've done a lot of studies on this um and the ideal frequency of training body parts is probably around three okay so each body part you want to train about three days a week now how how can you do this there's a lot of different ways to do this you could do a body part split where you're training three body parts on this day, three body parts on that day, another three, and then over the course of a week, you've done everything three times. I personally have seen by far the most success, not just with myself, but with the people I've trained, by just training full body. So you go to the gym two days a week, three days a week, just train your whole body. Start with the larger body parts. So legs, then go to back and chest, shoulders, arms, and then maybe finish with your core. Um, but that'll do, that'll do everything for you. 
I also like full body workouts because the when you send a muscle building signal, um, most of it is localized. So if I work out my bicep, most of the muscle building signal goes to my bicep. But there's also a systemic effect that happens. So like there's really cool studies where um, someone will have an arm that's incapacitated and then they'll work out the other arm and they actually lose less muscle from the arm that's incapacitated, mm -hmm. right? Because it's this kind of systemic effect. Mm -hmm. Whole body workouts send this really nice systemic muscle building effect for people. So I've just seen better results with full body workouts with most people. The people that benefit from the body part splits are typically so advanced that the amount of training that they would have to do with a full body workout would just make the workout inconvenient. It would be a two and a half hour workout because they do so much per per area, in which case it makes sense to split the body up. But most people, full body. Great, great. So so they're, this paradigm of having the leg day mm -hmm. once a week, no. that's not going to be ideal. No, what you when you, you send the muscle building signal, we know that when they've done this in studies, we see the muscle building signal uh, rise very quickly, peak, and then drop very quickly after about uh, 48 to 72 hours, even if you're still recovering. Remember, the adaptation signal is different, right? So even if you're still sore, that muscle protein synthesis signal peaks and then drops. So you probably want to hit the same body part at least three or four days later, not a whole week later, in which case you'll you'll get some muscle, muscle building effect, but you'll miss out on quite a bit. Wow. That's so awesome, man. Thank you so much. And by the way, in the Resistance Training Revolution, which I have a copy here in my hands, pick up a copy like right now. There are several templates yeah. in here, different workouts, and of course the science behind it all. It's a really, really great book, man. And I'm just so happy that you, you know, put your life energy and your experience into something like this that people can just extract. Like you've got, you know, over 20 years of experience in something that people can read in you know a couple of hours they can tear through this book it's such a great well-written book and man just thank you so much i appreciate it thanks for having me on sean thank you hey if you like this video make sure to check out this video right here what if i told you these are diseases of skeletal muscle first and that obesity diabetes heart disease cardiovascular disease begin in skeletal muscle first insulin resistance begins in skeletal muscle first and if we care about root cause medicine then we have to care about skeletal muscle.